I'm Leroy Garcia, and this is Blue Rain Gallery Podcast. Today we have Matthew Sievers, and uh, he's, he's a painter out of Idaho. Welcome, Matthew. Thank you. Love having you here today. Uh, long trip from uh, Idaho to, to Blue Rain, but we're excited you made it, and we love the work. Um, later in this podcast, we will be uh, doing a local podcast of uh, Matthew in front of his painting so we can talk a bit, little bit about the processes. Uh, but before we get into that, let's uh, ask typical questions that we do for, for most of our artists. Uh, tell us about where you were born, where you were raised, your introduction into art, your kind of journey into art. You might want to talk about things your father uh, influenced, people that have influence in you. So let's start there. Tell us a little sure. bit about yourself. So uh, I grew up in southeast Idaho, really a farm community. My early age, I was irrigating and working uh, my grandpa's barley farm. And um, my dad is an artist and I was always encouraged to draw and read and everything else. But I'd sit at the end of the field waiting for the water. You know, you build this little dike and builds up pressure in a, uh, a ditch. And then you sit at the end of the field as it like floods through the barley. And I'd sketch and draw, and if I got tired, I'd fall asleep, and the water would hit you like icy <laughs> cold and wake you up, and you'd go and move mm -hmm. it to the next field. And um, my dad, he actually um, got me these comic books that they were kind of like, ah, don't show them to your friends, because they were great drawings, but, you know, violent. It, this one I loved was Pitt. Um, the artist was Dale Keen, and he still does comic drawings and things, but... It was a big inspiration to look at the linear quality and the first, like, I don't know, almost 10 years of my career was really comic inspired um, where there was a dark line cutting everything out. And then I was doing texture and building it up with the oil paint where the, um, I don't know, the textile, the texture, the way the paint sits on the surface has always been one of the most interesting things for me. And I've gone away from so much outlining it, mm -hmm. but cutting things out with contrast, transparency, and a few things that I think are a little more exciting for me. So are you, um, are you self-taught artist or do you have formal schooling on it? Um, both. So I had several oil paintings completed before I finished high school. And um, I was able to get a scholarship to Utah State. Cool. Uh, but going to our school, you start to realize my dad was a great teacher. So dad, it wasn't, this is how you do it. You do it like me. I figured it out. I've cracked the code. It wasn't like that at all. It was very much like, this is color theory. This is how you draw, even though I'd rebel there. And then go do it, you know, do it your way. And, um, art school was often, you know, this is the way to do it. And I wasn't used to that kind of learning. So, uh, shortly into that, I was minoring in business. I just knew I wanted to make money and I went and worked for general electric for a summer. Um, the sales went, amazingly well and I contacted my dad and I was like you know in these three months I've made this big chunk of money I had like sixty thousand dollars and it was my first year of college and my dad had an opportunity he knew a gallery was closing on Main Street in Scottsdale and he's like hey you know you're getting this body of work together you're kind of showing it you haven't figured out exactly how to market yourself so he said if you want to invest let's open this gallery. So that's what I did. And I was um, showing his work primarily while painting and really going through this meat grinder because people would come in the front door and they'd think, oh, here's the salesman. And they'd walk up to a painting and I'm the only guy in there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm just kind of like this, just, you know, semi-casual, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not like dreadlocks and tattoos. They don't think I'm the artist. And they'd go up to one of my paintings and just rip it apart. And I'd like, oh, I just get beat down. And it's like, okay, 
That's such a that's such be a, strong. <laughs> um, as, as an artist myself, you don't realize. Um, maybe the audience doesn't realize, but when you're an artist and you put it out for the public, the critiquing happens, and um, sometimes people don't like your work. You know, it's just part of the deal, and it's a hard thing to to get through. Um, especially, the, you know, your psyche gets beat down a little bit. Oh, it's nerve wracking. But of course, if I was to wait even a few hours. I'm back at the desk or I'm back at the east I'm in the back room and I hear this conversation, I'd start eavesdropping and the next person through the door would love it. Mm -hmm. It would like speak to their soul. And it's just the way art is. Yes. Subjective. Most, oh, for sure. And I think a lot of my collectors, they're a little bit um, hesitant to trust their tastes mm -hmm. because you hear of like fine wine, fine art, and they're thinking, well, what if I have bad taste? Yeah. But art is so much like the music industry. Mm -hmm. You can love some country song that I do not like, and it's perfectly fine. Right. Same with any other genre of music and art. You know, sometimes you don't know why it speaks to you and not someone else, but that's part of it. That's what makes it so powerful and interesting. Yeah, you know, in my last uh, podcast, I, I did mention that, um, you know, a lot of people think they have to be highly educated, but you don't. You just have to find something you like that you can afford in your budget range. And that's a good place to start. And uh, yeah, so that's, I'm, I'm glad you brought up that point. Uh, we should all keep that in mind all the time. Um, let's talk about why you do the subject matter you do uh, and, and describe your subject matter as best you can. Your, your typical, so, work, what, what you paint. Oh, it's diverse. Definitely my subject matter is light. So wherever I travel, I love the outdoors and um, with the art market, I live in this very not art oriented community in Idaho. I'm not going to sell a painting there. People aren't coming to my studio and I'm okay with that. It's probably because it's the, <laughs> the birthplace of television from what That's I understand, right? right? Yeah. <laughs> well, who needs a painting? I've got this TV. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> So uh, it's travel, photograph, get inspired. And then when I sit down at the easel, it's whatever I'm in the mood to do. Um, but if it's a barn, it's how the light's hitting the barn. And I love saturating color. It's not necessarily perfectly natural color, though sometimes I go for that. More memory of a scene of the light. So I often will dial up the contrast and the darks and get this... Uh, kind of emotional impact. So light and emotion, I guess that's my subject matter. Then I'll paint trees, figures, portraits, um, lots of landscapes. I love landscapes. I say most, of, most of the work I've seen has been landscapes or cityscapes, yeah. things of that nature. And um, recently we asked you to participate in the uh, homage to uh, Joseph Henry Sharp. And I had never seen a figurative painting of yours before. And I was just very impressed. And then you showed up for this show with four more portraits. And I'm really impressed with those two. Awesome. So how often have you done portraits? So I've done them my whole career. But ironically, I'll, I'll put a few paintings in a market. And if they don't really take off, and then I take those same paintings, like, say, the figure. I took a lot of figure paintings to Seattle and they didn't sell maybe 15 years ago. I took that same body of work to Chicago and had one of my best shows ever. Um, I'm not sure why, some of it's just size. Um, for example, in Chicago, really wealthy homes still have lower ceilings. They're townhomes. Yeah, they're townhomes. Mm -hmm. So they're looking for a painting that fits in that space between these two windows. It's gotta be a 16 by 20. And I like to paint massive. Yeah, I'd love to paint like a, a 10 foot by 20 foot painting. That'd be wonderful. But yeah, it's not always the case for the figure. You've, you've got to find the right angle. Yeah. And one of those is in the Southwest. Like, I'd say I sell the majority, perhaps the majority of my artwork between Santa Fe and Scottsdale. And people who aren't familiar with those markets wouldn't realize that they're so, so different. Mm -hmm. Their Southwest art is so different. And it's like 
dried chilies versus suaros. Yeah. Go, go figure, right? Yeah. <laughs> but the artwork kind of is the same. And the, um, the sharp inspired portraits, mm -hmm. fell in love with them, fell in love with his work. And I feel like they're so powerful. They work in almost any market, but they really, I really, I really here. like the infusion of light and color kind of going across the faces. And uh, awesome. that was beautiful. It was well thought out. And uh, uh, not you weren't knocking off any, but you're inspired by and uh, added to. And I, I really liked that and appreciated that about your artwork. Thanks. Okay, let's go look at these paintings and let's talk about your processes because you're not just a painter, it's how you paint that differs from most painters. And we'll talk about that uh, downstairs as we review your show. Awesome, thanks. So we're down here uh, to review some of Matthew's work. And I, I wanted to bring the audience here because uh, Matthew paints a little bit different than most people. I mean, he's probably used to brushes and all kinds of things, but he uses, I'll let him describe. Tell us about this painting, the processes that you use to create the image. Absolutely. So I want to build up the paint and in oils, the old masters would do this. It was called lean to fat because there's not a lot of oil in the paint when it's thin. So my darkest dark, this tree was painted black like this. And then as that dries, I come over with a little bit thicker, oilier, more medium and build up to very thick paint. And I'm using all sorts of things to thin this so it's transparent. Rollers so what are, and yeah, tell, squeegees. tell us about rollers and squeegees. Oh yeah, well, and I'll find the coolest different tools to get a squeegee mark, like a, um, one of my favorites is a door sweep, where I'll oh. have the painting and the paint is fairly um, watery for the second layer, and I'll just drag this um, door sweep, you know, the rubber piece on the bottom of a door. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there's all sorts of Well, that's of like things. a squeegee just, too, isn't it? Oh, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so where did you learn to paint like that? Because most people are just, landscapes are uh, palette knife or brush, you know. So where did you come up with this idea and process? So it, it's not my idea. What it is, is being inspired by so many awesome artists right now. And the art world, it is growing so quickly because of platforms like Instagram. So if you look at artists in like New York, they're doing almost airbrush soft edges, or you look at an artist in San Francisco that's a lot of scrapes with like um, drips, or the Utah artists, it's all buttery brushwork. Mm -hmm. And I love those, I love all those, and I'll take it all, get inspired, and then, you know, do my thing. Right, right. Yeah. and. One of my biggest tools right now is using rollers. Um, the first person I saw... When you say roller, is it like a paint roller or is it a rubber roller? Yeah, it's a rubber roller, a, a brayer for like screen paint, printing. Screen print? I'll mm -hmm. use those a lot, but there's also electrical rollers. Like, um, I'll, I'll try different rollers for different effects and a different amount of paint. So this mark here, for example, is like if you were to overload a roller when you're painting a wall how it can fling paint it and get like a real mess. Oh, I'm used to that. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of how this area was approached before I came back with brushwork and cleaned it up. But I like that this reads like little leaves, all very spontaneous without me getting in there with one brush and making all these little leaf marks, which is so static and boring. I hate that. This is leaves yeah. right there. And this, that's the only mark like that in this whole painting. Mm -hmm. I'll, it, it, this was rolled, but very clean and transparent to create atmosphere and push this tree back, especially in the top. Um, this is more like a uh, squeegee to get these kind of linear vanishing point and the, the ray of light that is subtly in this pink and teal sky. And just let it all play together, you know? Mm -hmm. I. Uh, Explain to me the, the, your, your interpretation of light, your use of light in this painting. So this one's kind of unique for me, really. Often I have this hard light where this is much more um, diffused, like it was a foggy morning and the sun's burning it um, off. 
So the pink in the sky was very intense. This was like, like I don't know, just Pepto-Bismol pink, boom, right here. Mm -hmm. Because I knew I wanted that sense of warmth coming through the, the fog and how well these colors, which I love this combination, mm -hmm. how well that accents with this kind of earthy yellow tone, thrilled with it and with um, this color playing back into the sky as if it's almost um, reflecting mm -hmm. on the grass, like it's dewy and misty. So, so you're, you're, that's how you're getting this light, the backlight, the front light, everything's interacting um, with layering. Oh, for right? sure. Tons yeah, of yeah. layers. This, when you're looking at a Matthew Seaver painting, you're looking at tons and tons of different paints and colors laid on top of each other to develop the painting. Absolutely. So I really wanted to show off a few things in this painting because when I'm talking about atmosphere pushing that tree back, this one I'm letting an area dry completely and then mixing this color in a thin layer and you can see this Just like transparent yeah and very geometric really squared off lines but as you stand back this reads like a soft edge of a cloud despite these hard lines because they're so transparent oh, I love that there's so many geometric shapes in this and if you stand across the room it's a cloud yeah. it's a sweeping soft cloud it's beautiful, uh, Matthew. I like that. And I, I love the texture of thicker paint, too, mixed. Uh, it's just nice. Well, in a low light, oil paint, the thicker it is, it actually refracts light stronger, too. Mm. And seeing something in a gallery lighting, you're like, oh, yeah, it looks great. When you get it in a home, that's really the kind of lighting it's, it's painted it's for. for mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, let's talk about, let's go talk about your uh, homage to uh, sharp paintings that awesome. you brought it. Here we are with examples of Matthew's figurative work uh, based on homage to Joseph Henry Sharp that we produced a month ago. Um, I guess these pieces were done around the same time. Uh, it was a nice surprise. I wasn't expecting these, but, but that's great. So talk to, talk to us a little bit how you made these different from... Uh, we have kind of the original picture of Sharp here and then Matthew's translation of it. Uh, tell us why you translated the way you did. So... I'm working a lot in Photoshop to get kind of a sense of memory and emotion before I start painting, whether it's a landscape or barn or portrait. And all four of these were prepared at the same time as the fifth piece and the final piece. There was only going to be the five of the Sharp series, but they were all done in Photoshop and I fell in love with all of them. And I can oh, see why I like all of them. Oh man, <laughs> thanks. Originally it was going to be the one and then I was... I'd finished it up and my mind's thinking about like the atmosphere I created in this yes. area or the, the scrape. Cause this was like, he was emerging from trees and I'd put these yellows together and then I fell in love with it and how it has kind of this lens flare and this, um, pushes the figure in and out of this kind of, um, hazy background. Really loved it really wanted to paint it so i wanted to make sure that continuing the sharp series for this show at blue rain was going to um be a go and i was thrilled so uh this one in particular kind of plays off of what i love about these where it's a profile and it's not so much this is an exact person where, you know, the president portrait, he has to be facing you. This is clearly yeah, a yeah. president. <laughs> yeah, where here it's much more like, oh, she reminds me of my niece, my cousin, my sister. I really love those feelings. Just like how these lost and found edges are a sense of memory. Yeah, well, well I love the splash of color <laughs> that you've awesome. done in there. I think that's just beautiful. Well, Matthew, thank you for uh, talking to us today. And... Um, like to encourage everybody to subscribe to Blue Rain Gallery podcast. You can find us on our website under podcasts or YouTube or Spotify or any of those platforms that carry podcasts. In any case, thanks for attending. Awesome. Thanks. <laughs>